new podcast only on YouTube for right now. That's called Theological Truths Unveiled. And what we are doing is navigating biblical teachings in the digital age. And what I mean by that is that there is a lot, a lot, a lot of teachings on the internet that revolve around Christianity, God, the Bible, spirituality, religion, and I'm one of them, honestly, uh, because I preach on here and I have another podcast on here, and <laughs> so uh, you can lump me in with this category as well. And there's a ton of good teachers, a ton of good theology, a ton of good sermons and whatever that you can listen to. However, there is also a ton of ones that we should avoid, one that we should stay away from. So the whole purpose for this kind of new podcast that I'm presenting is uh, a way to help us discern what we're hearing online so that we can uh, not get led astray from bad teaching wrapped up in pretty packages, pretty much, and also how to spot biblical teaching and use it and have it actually affect our life and our relationship with God, because that's that's the whole thing that matters. So I do want you guys to know that I am not here to critique how the sermon is delivered. Not every pastor is super charismatic and super funny and super like Stephen Furtick, right? Not every pastor is Stephen Furtick. Some of them are Vody Bauckham, who I actually find him quite entertaining, but he's very direct, very straight to the point. Paul Washer, extremely the same way, very direct, very straight to the point. Just because they are not in the entertainment business does not mean that their message is bad, their delivery is bad, whatever. So this is not a podcast to critique the delivery of a message or a sermon or whatever. This is specifically to pull apart and to look at what is being taught in the message. Um, so we're going to watch some of people that, uh, from all over, you know, uh, this lady that we're listening to today, her name is Nadia Weber or Bowles Weber. It's either Weber or Weber. I think it's Weber, but I could be wrong. Sorry if I'm wrong, Nadia. But uh, she is a pastor in Colorado. She is one of the main leaders of the, what she calls the sexual reformation. Now, right off the bat, this is... I, I don't want to come across this as biased uh, because I don't want you guys to think that I'm just disagreeing with everything she says because of this. Uh, so just as a little background, Nadia... Bowles Weber is uh, one of the primary leaders in the sexual reformation movement where she is having a women. I mean, she's not making women do this. Women are voluntarily doing this, but they are voluntarily sending her their purity rings and she's against the purity movement, uh, which in, in her defense Purity has been used as kind of a weird weapon in the church. I'm not saying that purity is wrong. What I am saying is that she is is kind of teaching, don't worry about it, right? When the Bible is very clear for what purity means. Now, it should not be weaponized, like I said earlier. It should not be used as a way to, uh, I don't know, get what you want out of people, I guess, or make people feel bad or whatever, Purity is something that is to be held um, in honor of God, and it should be just that. It should be an honor, not a not a something to be afraid of, but an honor, right? An honor to hold it for God. Anyway, she is uh, not pro that and pro LGBT, uh, pro all the all the things. Really, she's pro. She's pro. She's pro. So we're gonna dive into it. We are watching it's called animate faith uh dash the cross dash nadia bowles weber and we're just gonna watch some talk some watch some talk some we'll see how it goes as we go okay so here we go cool intro if you guys can do that for me that'd be great I came to the Christian faith by a twisted road. I was raised in a pretty fundamentalist church, 
which didn't have much need for smart mouth girls. They also didn't have much need for symbols and art and candles and incense and icons and like, well, most of the stuff I really love about church now. It took me 10 years, uh, a nagging chemical abuse problem and a cute new Lutheran boyfriend for me to come back to the Christian faith. And in this new church I'm a part of, just right off the bat, what I want you guys to notice is the history that Nadia is Nadia 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 is sharing with us. And I mean, even if I don't agree with what she's about to share um, as a whole, her past is real. Like this is actually something that has affected her. She said that she grew up in a fundamental church where a smart mouthed girl wasn't welcome. What that sounds like is that she wasn't allowed to ask questions. Uh, she wasn't allowed to raise her own thoughts, her own concerns, her own whatever. She she just had to kind of sit there, shut up, listen, and believe. And one thing that I teach and I love to teach is that God isn't afraid of your questions. We should be able to ask God why. Because God's not afraid of it, right? If God put it in the Bible, he put it in the Bible for a reason— and he's not afraid to to reveal what that reason is for. Now, the big thing is a lot of people tend uh, to ask questions in the Bible and then look to other sources other than Jesus to find the answer. And that's where a lot of problems come up, and it leads to what we call now as deconstruction. And deconstruction is essentially where people are deconstructing their faith, taking it apart from the top down, and ultimately most of them become not Christian by the end of it, or they become like uh, what this woman is. But uh, I just want you guys to share that that this is kind of, this is a sad story for her. She couldn't ask questions. She couldn't engage in the church. Um, and then she had a drug abuse problem. She got this Lutheran boyfriend. Now she's back in the church, which is better than nothing. Um, except the road that she goes down is kind of pretty off. But, yeah. Unlike the one I grew up in, I found myself surrounded by stained glass and crosses. Actually, lots and lots of crosses. And the crosses were, were so beautiful to look at. And while I loved looking at them, what I really wanted was for someone to explain to me how an instrument of death and torture in the Roman Empire, how did that have anything to do with a loving God? There have been a lot of views on that over the years. One is that Jesus had to die because his dad was mad at us. And okay, so first things first let's just kind of pull this apart a little bit uh she, what she's saying is like why we wear crosses all the time right we have crosses as tattoos and we wear crosses or on our bible but what's crazy about a cross is it's similar to like if if a guy came into your house with a hatchet and hacked your family to bits right and now for the rest of your life you being the only survivor wore like a hatchet shaped like necklace or put hatchets on tattoos on your car to symbolize like the death your family suffered. It is kind of strange, right? Uh, but the deal is that the cross was an extreme form of punishment, right? Like this was an extreme form of form of punishment. They had it down to a science where they knew exactly how to keep you on the brink of death without actually dying. They knew how to make you die faster, how to make you die slower. Like, like they knew exactly what they were doing with the cross, and it was excruciating. It was extremely painful. It took hours. Jesus himself hung up there for six hours. And so it is kind of strange that we wear a cross on our shirts and whatever, until you recognize what the cross has to do with it. Yes, it is a mode of, of execution. It is a method of torture. But it was also the final stop that Jesus took to free us from our sins and to bring us into relationship and unity with himself. So the cross, though it was meant for evil, 
God turned it to work for good. And now this cross is a beautiful representation, a symbol of what Jesus did for us. Because he wasn't hacked to death with a hatchet unwillingly. He willingly went to the cross. He willingly went there on his own to die for us. That's why we wear the cross. And that's why we recognize it. And when we see it, we don't see a form of murder or a form of uh, torture. We see freedom. We see love. We see sacrifice on the cross. Um, and now I want you guys to recognize what Nadia is about to do. You can see in her face right now that she's a little bit, she's, she's over and she's going to over animate this. Now there's a word for it. I'm not sure what that word is called, but she's going to describe a couple different, uh, theories, quote unquote, of why Jesus died on the cross and how it has to do with the cross and Roman torture or whatever. And she's going to hyperbolize her thoughts about this and this is kind of a clever way to get you the listener to like unconsciously side with her like oh yeah that is kind of a weird thing that is strange like why like why would god do that like so so she, she's going to oversimplify some of these and i just want you guys to listen in here as we uh as she talks okay one is that Jesus had to die because his dad was mad at us. In this way of thinking, we're born bad and can't be 100% good, but should try really hard anyway, and then feel guilty for our inevitable failures since our failures are the reason Jesus had to die. This way of seeing the cross, namely where Jesus is God's little boy and he only had one, and God had to kill his little boy because we were bad. Well, the problem with this way of thinking about the cross is that it turns God into some kind of like divine child abuser. And then Jesus is sort of a supporting character in this abusive drama between God and humanity. I call this the angry daddy God waiting to let Sonny have it because we were bad image of God. First of all, that's a long title for an image of God. You know, titles should be kind of short and concise. But, so let's look at some stuff here. She filled in a lot of, she said a lot of things there. Uh, and she said them very simply to where it's like, you don't really notice it, but it feels wrong, right? If like, just, just listening to it feels like, ah, there is something going on here. Sorry, I forgot my Bible. So I'm using this other Bible in my room and I'm not used to it, but what she shares, I, I know that that we literally just heard it, but you heard her say that in this theory that she has is a a cosmic child abuse. That is literally what she said, a cosmic child abuse. You will also hear this verbiage by other pastors uh, like Rob Bell, and uh, who wrote the book Love Wins, and a very popular book, and... It, it is so wrong on so many levels. Now, ultimately, what she's talking about is the atonement uh, theory of Christ's death. The atonement theory is that Jesus died to atone for the sins that we owed. And she's going to kind of re-say this same exact thing as a legal terminology coming up after we, we start again. But... The atonement theory, hands down, is exactly what happened on the cross because Jesus did atone for our sins. Look back to the Old Testament about what happened when people sinned. Um, there were some sins that they would atone for by being, by being stoned to death, but ultimately they would sin, they would mess up, and they would bring a sacrifice, uh, and the sacrifice was a ram, a goat, a sheep, a cow, pigeons, whatever. They would bring their sacrifice to the altar and through uh, through help with the priest at the church or at the tabernacle at the time, they would slaughter the sheep. They would pour, sprinkle its blood. They would do all the things. They would burn it. They would boil it. They would do everything that was required of them. And after that, they were 
forgiven of their sins, right? Now, now again, this is still a little bit simplified version, but ultimately what a, paid the price of their sin, the blood price of their sin was the sheep or the goat or the pigeons, whatever. Now there was still a sacrifice on the person's end. It's not like it was just easy to go around sinning and sacrifice sheep. It, it still wasn't an excuse for them to go sin because sheep and goats and herds and whatever, like that was their livelihood, right? And if they didn't have their livelihood be those things and they sinned, they would buy one so that they could sacrifice it. So there was a monetary value to their sin. Per, uh, they, they had to buy the sheep or they had to give their sheep that makes them money. But they did not pay the blood price. The atonement of the sin came from the sheep, came from the the cow the only problem with this though is that like how is a sheep gonna pay for an eternity worth of punishment of death that one sin brings with it right because the bible says that the punishment the the weight of sin the price of sin is death and we have all sinned and all fallen short of the glory of god so if just burning a goat could keep you from going to hell forever, we would have all burned goats by now. But the thing is that the blood of bulls, the blood of goats, the blood of sheep was not good enough to save them forever. Hebrews 10 shed some light on this. Uh, just starting at verse 1, it says, The law is only a shadow of good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they have not stopped being offered? Meaning, if these sacrifices were enough to save you, you would have done it and stopped, but you're still making sacrifices. For the worshipers would have all been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So they would sacrifice, but it didn't actually remove their sin. It was a reminder of their sin. It was a reminder of the gravity and weight of their sins. Now, don't get me wrong. God still forgave. God still forgave sins or else nobody would have gotten into heaven. Nobody could have a relationship with God. And God had a very strong relationship with his people now, granted, the people, the Israelites, I mean, you read through Judges and you, you'll you question that and be like, yeah, uh, maybe they didn't have that strong. But no, God loved his people. He forgave sins. He's been forgiving sins from the beginning. But verse 5 says, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you were prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, my God. Verse 8 says, First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that, by the sacrifice coming up, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So we don't have to continue offering sacrifices of bulls and goats and sheep year after year as a reminder of our sins because Jesus now paid the price that the goats and the sheep were a reminder of what was needed. We needed a better offering. We needed a better sheep, something that we would call the spotless lamb, which is what Jesus is called multiple times. But that still doesn't address the cosmic child abuse thing that she's bringing up here. And so what she's saying is that it was cosmic child abuse. God abused his son Jesus by sending him down on the cross to die for us. And... I mean, think about it. I have a daughter. I have Atlee. If I was to bring Atlee somewhere and purposely allow her to go die to save somebody else, I would probably 
be held responsible for the death of my daughter because I allowed her to die for something she didn't have to do, right? I allowed for her to die. And yeah, uh, God did allow Jesus to die. And he did allow Jesus to go to earth, to go from God to man, 100% God, 100% man still, but still like to become a man after you're like in heaven for eternity. There's a lot of humility involved with that. That is a huge digression, <laughs> you know? Uh, but she's missing one vital thing that we see in John chapter 10. We, uh, there's a lot in John chapter 10 that we could say. I'm just going to start in verse 25, okay? So this is what it says. It says, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you don't believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And then... Uh, it says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. And verse 30, I and the father are one. Jesus here, uh, and then look at the response of the Pharisees, the Jewish people. It says, again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. Why? Because Jesus was claiming to be God. He was saying, I and the Father are one. Later on, he says that, that before Abraham was, I am. That was a huge uh, thing for Jesus to say that he was actually God in the flesh. That these Jewish people are looking at their creator in the eyes. But that is what Jesus is saying. So Jesus is making this claim that he is God. So how would it be child abuse for God to allow Jesus to go to the cross to die for us when Jesus is God? God didn't just send down his son God himself said there is no other sacrifice worthy to pay the price of these sins, to atone for the penalty of these sins, so I am going to go do it myself. I am going to lay down my life for my, 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 my people. Earlier in John chapter 10 too, uh, this is also an extremely important, important thing to remember. Where he says in verse 17, he says, The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life. I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority. Now remember, this is Jesus talking. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So Jesus didn't go unwillingly to the cross. He, he didn't get cosmically child abused. He went on his own accord. He had the authority to lay down his life and to pick up his life. He said no one took it from him. He gave it up himself. So Nadia is 100% wrong with what she's saying here. The atonement of Jesus Christ is good enough. It is strong enough. And it is what happened. So you can already imagine that if she's already wrong two minutes into the film, what's the rest of it going to be like? Well, we're going to look it up. And you know, you know, the other thing that she mentioned that we should take care of real quick is she said that we can never be 100% good and we always have to feel bad about our sin because uh, that's what Jesus died on the cross for. And I get it. Like, I've, I've kind of seen that teaching in my days where where uh sin is well, you know some people believe that after every sin we lose our salvation absolutely wrong that's a discussion for another time but uh we just saw in John 10 that those who are in the hands of Jesus don't get removed from the hands of Jesus he keeps them safe so our salvation is secure in the arms of Christ that's that but it would be a bummer to go our whole life thinking we can never be good enough for Jesus. We will never amount to anything. We have to feel bad for all of our sins. But the Bible says that 
uh, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Once we are saved, our sins are removed, and we are forgiven of them. Jesus says that he casts them as far as the east is from the west, and they're gone. No, you will not be 100% good in this life. God is still working on us. He's still sanctifying us. He's still allowing us to grow to become more like him. But that does not mean that we are worthless pieces of trash scum of the earth. We are not. We are holy, righteous, and deemed and redeemed in the eyes of God. We are we are able to go into the throne room of God to live in eternity in the presence of God and to have peace with God and to be uh, in love with God, to be a bride of Jesus. We have all of these things because of the sacrifice that Jesus gave us. So what happens if we sin? Well, it kind of feels bad, but that's something that we call conviction. And through conviction, we experience repentance. We repent of the sin that we commit and turn back from this life of sin, from this 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 sin that's in our life. We turn from it and we come back to Jesus. We can all repent. We can all turn back to God. That doesn't remove the earthly consequence of our sin, right? Because all sin has consequence. Some of it, um, you know, if you speed on the highway and you get pulled over, yeah, you sin because you broke the law, right? But also you're probably going to get a ticket of it even though God forgives you. That's just how it goes. But don't let uh, what this lady is saying, Nadia, fool you that that sin is something we have to constantly be sad about, be upset about because Jesus died on the cross for us. He willingly went, and he actually set us free from sin. So that is incredible. Let's see what she says next. This one is the legal transaction theory. Another popular view of the cross is that it's like a legal transaction between us and God. Uh, think of a heavenly ledger where it tracks all the times we're bad and then puts a dollar amount next to them. And then in the final column is how much we owe God once all of these sins are tallied. Well, the tear. And well, someone has to pay it off, so it might as well be the one guy who never added to the tally because he didn't sin. So if Jesus was killed as a sacrifice for us, then we'd be even with God. This is what I like to call God as cigar chomping loan shark, pissed off and demanding his pound of flesh. The problem with both of these views yes. of the cross. Um, let's, so that's the problem apparently. So this one is the mob boss, God chomping a cigar and Sadly, some people actually, obviously, um, some people do see Jesus as this. And one of the areas that you will see people kind of have this feeling about God is in direction to tithe. Tithe is kind of like such a weird thing for some people where they are extremely rigid about it. And they'll teach, um, like, if you, you'll, you'll see this, if you watch the movie uh, American Gospel 2, somebody shares a quote that people will say, oh, you know what, if if God doesn't, uh, if you don't give to God, God's going to take it from you somehow, right? And the guy on American Gospel says that it goes from being God the Father to the Godfather, because people see that Jesus wants your money, and he wants this and that, and so we're dealing with money with this legal transaction. The reason why she brings up this whole uh, legal transaction thing comes it comes from a lot of spots in scripture. A really one of my favorite spots that we kind of see it is in Colossians 2. It's in verse 14. I'm going to start in verse 12, though. So this is what it says. It says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses. Uh, he did that by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Uh, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So what she's saying is that there is a holy ledger in heaven that God is using, that he is putting down tallies and writing down how much we owe, and that 
ended up being too much money, so God was like, eh, we'll let Jesus pay the price on behalf for all of them. Uh, however, if, G if God was a mob boss and Jesus wasn't God himself, this would still be very generous of a mob boss to be like, ah, oh, you know, this company owes me like three trillion bucks, but we'll just kill like your, we'll just kill one of these guys, right? And, and we're, we're even, right? No, they want money more than they want death. The fact of the matter is that if there is a holy ledger that has a tally for our sins and how much we owe, the, uh, the collection is quite simple. It's death. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. It doesn't say that there is a price for each sin. It doesn't say that each sin might cost you like an arm or a leg, no pun intended, or this or that, or, you know, you have to do 20 uh, Hail Marys or, or like, no, the wages of sin is death. So the penalty to pay is death. If you sin, you deserve die. I mean, you deserve to die. You deserve uh, life apart from God. You deserve hell. You deserve death. And then Jesus being the holy and spotless lamb, which we have seen from the very beginning, it has been shown to us over and over and over through reminders of uh, sacrifices that, that made at the tabernacle, through different uh, prophecies, through different actions that we see in the Bible. It has been shown over and over and over through festivals and whatever that this was going to happen from the Messiah, and Jesus was the Messiah. He is the Messiah, and he came down, and he paid that price for us willingly on his own. So he did pay the price for us. There was a legal demand to our sin, which was death, and Jesus paid it because he could. He did it willingly. He did it on his own. Uh, so let's see what she says is the problem with these two deals is that what we do is we just take these really disturbing human characteristics that we have, like violence and vengeance and greed, and then we project these up really big and say, that's what God must be like. So we basically start with us, our issues and values and hang-ups, and then we like pawn them off on God and say, well, that must be what the cross is about. Um, I don't really get this. I'm going to try to explain it. I feel like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> if she's saying what I think she's saying, it's that we take our, our shortcomings and we say that that's what God is like, which I, be I believe that a lot of people would actually believe in God more if they were able to do that, because if we could change how he was, uh, just with what we say about him, right? It would be easier to to do that. But the thing about the Bible, the Word of God, is that this thing should be, this book right here, should be the most challenging thing we ever read. Why? Because it it goes against our idea of God. If If we... If what she says is real and we project our shortcomings, our our uh, our vengeance and whatever that she just mentioned onto God, when we see God in the Bible, it will reveal that he's much better than what we know about him and that we cannot shape God based off of even our belief about him. What I believe about God does not change who he is, which I'm very thankful for because I would be upset if what not correct about God, but what she is saying doesn't change the fact of who God is. And so if we, even if we do project our stuff onto God, the Bible shares with us that our projections are wrong and that we need to get to know God for who he truly is, not just who we want him to be, not what we're projecting onto him, not what's convenient for us. We should be challenged by the word of God only um, to know God for who he is. So regardless of if we project anything on him or not, it doesn't change who he is. It does change how we see him. It does change how we respond to him, but it doesn't change him. And it takes it takes humility and it takes courage and boldness and uh, a lot of Jesus, a lot of the Holy Spirit to come to the Bible 
to look at God for who he really is. But let's see what she continues to say. But the thing is, is that both of these versions of the cross have God like standing smugly above it with his arms crossed looking down. I mean, when the who fact said that? of the matter is that God doesn't actually stand above the cross at all. God actually hangs from the cross. Here's the thing. Okay, can you see how this is just a little bit confusing? Because um, if God hangs from the cross, then who was she saying Jesus was, right? She's kind of she's kind of proving that that the atonement uh, that she talked about earlier was correct because it was God hanging on the cross. If anyone could pay for our sins, it would be God, and it, it was God, right? We call him Jesus because he was 100% man, 100% God. He's part of the Holy Trinity, three in one, but he is God. He is on the cross. So when she says God wasn't above the cross, he was on the cross, yes, he he was on the cross. Um, let's continue to see what she's saying. The most reliable way to legitimately know anything about the nature of God is to Look at how God chose to reveal God's self in Christ. And when we look at that, I mean, when we really look at that, we see who God is and how God chose to reveal God's self in a cradle and on a cross. See, at the cross, it's like God is saying, pay attention. This is the logical end of your value system, and it's not my value system. And here's where yours will always end, It'll always end in the suffering of God. Here is the extent I will go, says God, to defy your idea of me as a vengeful God, because I won't even lift a finger to condemn the people who hung me. Man. Okay, so, so first of all, she's putting a lot of words in God's mouth that he never said in the Bible, uh, which is a major, major, major red flag, and we've seen tons of red flags in this so far. But, <laughs> um, yeah, she... <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of having a hard time following exactly what she's trying to say. She's saying that God is telling us that, hey, this cross is a representation of, I don't know, where your life and value system is going, pretty much. Saying, um, if you keep putting wrath on me, if you keep putting vengeance on me or whatever, like, it's going to lead to death or harm or something, I don't know. Um, and she says that he didn't lift a finger to condemn those who... Uh, persecuted him and he didn't because Jesus went willingly he went willingly to the cross why would he why would he why would he fight back and condemn and and whatever the people who put him on the cross when he went willingly on his own also he was dying for the very people who put him on the cross he died just as much for them as he died for me he died for all of us and I'm sure that she would, I'm sure that Nadia would agree with that, that Jesus died for all of us. But she's saying for a totally different purpose. She's saying that Jesus wants to show that he is not a God of wrath and a God of vengeance when it's very clear that, that Jesus is the judge and God does have a wrath against sin. He does have a wrath against sin. That's why hell is real. That's why Jesus is so passionate that's why he loves so deeply. That's why there's so many things about God. And Nadia is going to want to focus on the fact that God is love. But I say this in multiple other things. That when we... God is love, okay? I don't want I don't want to discourage that by any means. God is certainly love. That's totally biblical. However, God is not just love. God is more than just love. But whenever you focus on God just being love, or whenever you say, ah, oh, I don't need theology, I just need Jesus, or whatever, then you see that Jesus is love, that you, that God is love, 
and you twist the definition of love to eventually be to become what the world's definition of love is, which is approval and just utmost acceptance regardless of, of sin in your life. And you begin to no longer no longer lead people to Jesus, no longer help people have a a actual faith-filled life in Jesus to be the holy and righteous people that they are. And now you're just patting them on the back saying, hey, add a boy, you're doing it, uh, whatever. Like if you sin, nah, no big deal. Um, Jesus loves you. It probably wasn't even a sin to begin with. So Nadia would love to see that Jesus is just love because it's a very easy thing. It's a very easy doctrine to follow. But then you forget that God is love He's mercy, he's justice, he is, he does have wrath against sin, he is a judge, God is all of these things, he is not just love. Let's keep looking, um, hopefully we can describe some of this better as she goes on. So I will simply not allow you to project your puffed up human traits on me as though I'm like a bigger, better version of the best parts of you or a bigger, badder version of the worst parts. The Again, the Bible, there. <laughs> it's easy to read into the Bible, but that's why we read it. Uh, that's why we rely on the Holy Spirit when we read the Word of God, because the Word of God will prevent what she's saying here right now. Uh, we do, I mean, honestly, we do have things in our life that contribute to our worldview and our view of God, right? Like if you were, your your father probably has influenced your idea of God. Uh, trauma from church, trauma from, from your past, like Nadia, um, that was real trauma. That was real things that actually happened to her, which also would have influenced her idea of God. But again, I said it before, and I'm just saying it again. The Bible shows us who God really is. It, it cuts through our trauma, it cuts through our past, it cuts through all of our, our biases and, and political parties, and like it cuts through all of this, and it reveals to us the truth about God. And it should challenge you, because God is a challenging God. He is not you. His ways are higher than your ways. His ways are, high, are different than your, your ways. His thoughts are different than your thoughts. You are not God, so you are not going to be able to 100% relate to God. But God does reveal himself through Scripture. So even if your father had a positive or negative uh, influence on your view of God, the Bible will help clear that up and say, hey, this is who you think I am. This is who I actually am. And the Bible will say, hey, you've thought of me this way. You thought that I was just love, but I'm actually all of these things. I'm, I'm so much more than just love. And here's what my love looks like. Here's what your love looks like. And it should challenge us to, to put away our definition of things and take up God's definition of things. It should challenge us to put aside our idea of who God is and take up God's idea of who he is. And God is so much better, so much stronger, so much more perfect, so much more beautiful and holy and righteous. He is so much more than what we uh, could portray onto him. He is so much more than that. A, a lot of the times people are unwilling to do that because they don't like some of the teaching of God. For instance, um, you know, God will call out your sin and he will lead you to a holy and righteous life. He will do that. The Bible will never give you an excuse for sin. The Bible will never tell you, hey, I'll allow it to remain. I'll allow the sin in your life to stay uh, I just do good on everything else. The Bible calls you to holy, righteous living with Christ. It calls you to die to yourself. That means die to yourself. That means if you were born a certain way or you lean towards a certain way or there's sin in your life that is you struggle to get into, God still says to die to yourself and to be alive in him. It says, how are you, uh, though you are dead to sin, supposed to still live in it? The Bible will challenge you to leave your life of sin and to cling on to the holiness and righteousness of God, which is uncomfortable because it shows how vulnerable we are 
and how much we need God. And a lot of us don't want God to be something that we need. A lot of people want God to be something that just kind of like amplifies their life. Uh, let's keep going and see what's next. Cross is, is actually about God saying, I would rather die than be in the sin accounting business anymore. On the cross, we don't, we don't see a legal transaction where Jesus pays our debt. On the cross, we actually see God. The cross is God's self-revelation, but it's also God's judgment. But the thing is, the judgment is forgiveness. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing is an eternally valid statement. Because from his cross, Christ the King loves the betrayer, loves the violent, loves the God killer in all of us. And it's finally only a God who can, who can enter into our human existence and suffer our insults with only love and forgiveness that can possibly save us from ourselves. I think the early Christians actually understood this. They didn't that's, what they, that's what they all say. I think early Christians actually understood this. If, they, if there's a point that they want to make, they will always say they think early Christians actually understood this because... Uh, because it shows some kind of validity to their point that they're making, apparently. But so she's saying that God did not come down to to pay a debt. He came down to reveal something about himself. And what he re is revealing about himself is that, hey, I would rather die than be in the sin accounting business anymore. That was what she said. I would rather die than to worry about your sins and to worry about all of these things and like forget it you know i i just want to i just want you guys to be forgiven and i just want you guys to be loved and that's it so she's saying when jesus said god forgive them for they know not what they do that was his way of saying forgive everybody forever because they don't know what they're doing they don't know that is sin they don't know uh, the effects that it has, they don't know. So just forgive them. We'll move on. It'll all be good. I'm going to die as a just a representation of this. Do you think that Jesus would really come to the earth to die just to get a point across? Just to, just to, like when Jesus came to the cross to die, he took away our sins forever. He atoned our sins with his blood. He paid this price. He did all of these amazing things. He he took this the keys of death away, gave us life, gave us freedom, redemption, holiness, made us into a kingdom of priests. He did all of these things when he died on the cross, right? And he also gave us access to the Father because when Jesus died, the earth shaked and that curtain in the tabernacle ripped from top to bottom. And now we have access to the Father through Jesus. Jesus didn't come here to die just to prove a point and said, Hey, I don't like this. I don't like that I have to deal with your sin anymore. So er, I'm going to die on the cross just so you guys can uh, just look at how much I, I don't like, like it. You know, forgive them forever. No, dude. What Jesus did on the cross was the most self-sacrificing, most loving, most forgiving, most beautiful thing that any human has ever done for anybody. Jesus died on the cross for us. God himself made flesh, came, lived a sinless and spotless life, and then died on the cross once and for all, for all people to have access and peace to the Father, forgiveness of their sins, victory in Jesus, and eternity with God. That's what he did. And so it's a shame that this Nadia girl thinks that this was simply just a way of telling people that he doesn't want to account for sin anymore. He would rather die. When you know what? Sin is in direct opposition to the character and nature of God. It is who God isn't. That's what sin is. That's why he has a wrath against this. 
That's why it is so important. That's why the eternal punishment of sin is death. And that's why it was important enough for Jesus to come and die on the cross for our sins. Yes, to forgive us. She has it good on there. It says forgiveness on the cross. Forgiveness is what Jesus provided a way for on the cross, was to be forgiven. But though it is for forgiveness for all men, not all men receive the forgiveness that Jesus has provided. And because you have to come to the Father for it. And it sounds a lot like Nadia would be in favor of what we would call universalism. And what universalism is, is a teaching that all people go to heaven. All roads lead to heaven um, because of this very reason. She's saying that God's deal is that he doesn't want to care about sin anymore. He just wants everybody to be forgiven. And it doesn't have to be through Jesus. It can be through anybody. She would be uh, probably a universalist. I would have to look more into her teachings, into her statement of faith. But I'm sure that that's something that she would jive with. You don't have to come through Jesus. You don't have to come through anybody. Uh, you just have to live life, right? And you're saved. You'll be saved. You'll go to heaven, regardless of what that looks like. And if you mess up, eh, whatever. God doesn't actually care, right? Let's say you never get over your sin. Eh, whatever. Doesn't matter. Let's say, let's say whatever happens in life, doesn't really matter. You'll go to heaven, which is not real. Jesus is the only way to heaven because he is the, he is the access to forgiveness. He paid the price. He did the two things that she said he didn't do on the cross. That is what he did. See the, the cross is a place of glory and triumph. They knew that God chooses what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And just to be clear. Okay. God chooses what's foolish in the world because that's all that is in the world. We, <laughs> we are, who is not foolish? Who has not done stupid things, right? Yeah. And, and God, like there's two separate deals, right? There's, uh, there's godly wisdom and earthly wisdom, and he does use the foolish people of earth to shame the earthly wisdom using godly wisdom, right? Because, uh, the world will think that godly wisdom is actually stupid or folly, as the Bible would say often, uh, but it's not. But that is why Jesus used imperfect people, because there is nobody else. It, it, the only perfect person that God used was Jesus, and Jesus was God. So it makes sense that that's what happened. But you and me, we have sinned, we have fallen short of the glory of God, and God loves us anyway. That's one of the beautiful things about it. Let's keep going. These were not popular messages with the Roman Empire. The irony, of course, is that just a couple centuries into the Christian faith, the church aligned itself with empire rather than opposing it. And we began to resemble the... Okay, she's, she's getting on a little tangent that uh, Brandon Robertson went on in the video that I critiqued uh, also not too long ago, um, where she is saying that Christianity teamed up with the Roman Empire which, eh, in a way, kind of, I don't think it is the way that she's saying, but let's look anyway. The very forces that rejected Christ in the first place. And this would also be the point in history where we encrusted crosses with gold and jewels as if we're trying to mask the foolishness of a God who suffers and dies. And in the end, the church, we're the ones who made the cross a representation of triumph the triumph of cultural Christendom that, let's be honest, has, has often trafficked in wealth and power and influence and actually the very things that the cross stands against. So while we might be seeking a Christianity based in glory and triumph, Jesus is seeking us in the places that he's always been found, namely in human frailty and human brokenness in the unwashed masses. He's wooing us in simple table fellowship and contact with the unclean and confronting the powers that be. Because the shape of Christ's church isn't of an empire, American or Roman or otherwise. The shape of Christ's church is decidedly cruciform. And as someone who bears her own scars from disease and bad decisions and addictions and just life in general, I just think there's something so 
powerful about the fact that even in the resurrection of Jesus, God's actual moment of glory and triumph, that even then, the body of Jesus had scars. Okay, that's the end of it. Um, so we're going to pretty much wrap it up. Yeah, Jesus' body still has scars because it is a, it is a representation of his love and what he did for us. He, he, he doesn't have to have the scars. He does willingly choose to have them, which I do think is actually quite cool um, because I would like to see those scars someday, not the way that Thomas did where he wouldn't believe until he saw them. I want to see them because I want to see... I don't know. I, I want to see... I just want to see the love tangibly. You know what I'm saying? I want to see Jesus' love that he died for me on the cross tangibly, the the scars on his hands and his feet and his rib. I believe that they're there, and I believe that Jesus is alive. I just, I would really love to see those someday. But, uh, yeah, she, she talks about uh, Jesus showing us in, in our frailty and, and those kind of things. Guys, the deal is that she kind of, she kind of has a point here. Okay. We are imperfect. And a lot of, of believers, um, a lot of churches, actually let's, let's scratch that. A lot of non-believers get the, the feeling that they have to be perfect to come to Jesus. Right. And they'll say, like, oh, I thought, like, if I'd ever step inside a church, I'd instantly burst into flames. Like, no, you wouldn't. And you don't really believe that. You just, you're afraid of entering in the presence of God because you know that you've done wrong. But God isn't there to strike you down and to punish you. God literally died on the cross to not do that, to save you from your sins, to love you. And he does love you in your brokenness. He does love you in your frailty. He does love you in in your imperfection. Second Corinthians twelve gives us just this little story of Paul. Let's go to verse eight. In in Second Corinthians twelve verse eight, it says three times. I, this is Paul speaking. He says three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. He's talking about a thorn in the flesh, whether that thorn is a physical ailment or a sin or whatever. I go with that I believe that he had a physical ailment that he believed was a weakness that made him insufficient to minister. Other people believe that it is a sin. I, I believe it's an ailment. But he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take this thing away from me, this thorn. Uh, but God said to me, uh, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. So, Jesus didn't take away whatever Paul was dealing with because though Paul was struggling, God was still good. God is still powerful. God is still able to go. And in Paul's weakness, God is made strong. What that means is for me, guys, if you don't know me or if you do know me, I struggle with things like depression and anxiety, and I'm not that great of a talker. I'm just not that great of a talker, and I wish I was. I'm not. But yet somehow every week I get up and I preach at my church every week. I post our podcasts every week. I post these videos and every week um, the word gets out, though I am not great at presenting it. And that just shows me that it is not me doing it, but God doing it through me. Now, of course, I do have some role to play because... <laughs> If I, if I shared this like false humility and said, uh, it's not me, it's just God, well, I'm not that good of a preacher, okay? So <laughs> if it was just God, like the whole world would be toppled over on their faces, but but you know what I'm saying. Uh, God uses me, though I am imperfect, and he does powerful things through my imperfection, and he receives the glory because of it, which I think is beautiful and wonderful. I love that. So anyway, uh, and she mentions this thing about tabletop worship or whatever, which I actually really like. I think that a lot of uh, good talks, a lot of good conversations with each other, a lot of good community happens around the table, not at church, but around, uh, you know, a table at, at 
Golden Corral. Man, when was the last time you went to Golden Corral? But, you know, you, you go to Outback Steakhouse or McDonald's or Burger King or whatever, like sit around, have coffee with people, and you talk, and that's where a lot of growth comes. Um, and that's where a lot of lives can get changed. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus does not want churches. He does want churches. Churches are beautiful. Um, but he's more concerned with the church body, the church body, than he is with the building itself. So anyway, uh, that's that's my little thing over this uh, Nadia Bowles Weber. We might talk more about her stuff later on. I don't really want to just uh, talk about things that I don't agree with. But this is a really great example of something that is packaged really, really well. She has cool animation. She was dressed nice. I liked her tattoos. Uh, and she she is a good speaker, a good present pre presenter, right? But sadly, what she is sharing is absolutely heretical. It is not biblical. Uh, but it's like sprinkled with like some, it's like sprinkled with some truth, you know? Brandon Robertson that we shared with the other week, that was like hardly any biblical truth at all. This girl has a, a like some just like spit on there. But y you didn't see her really use much scripture. You didn't see her uh, use things in context. She took things that she liked and she amplified it. And she took things that she didn't like and she hyperbolized it or she explained them too simply and she uses that as a way to coax you into getting in on her side. And this is why it's important to know the Bible and to know God for who he is and not what you want him to be. Because it'll keep you safe from teachings like this that will undoubtedly lead you astray. All right, guys. So this is, uh, this is our Unveiling Truth and Theology podcast. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time. Bye.